Chapter 18 Lincoln Waters What is Lincoln Waters doing here? snarled Garrett. He isn't even allowed on the property. I need everyone to remain calm, stated Lincoln, raising his hands to get their attention. I'm conducting an investigation, an irritated Kepler told him. Whatever you need to say to the Ramsleys can wait for a more appropriate time. If everyone remains calm, then some of you will live, promised Lincoln, as he lifted the side of his ill-fitting blazer so everyone could see the bomb strapped to a vest which covered his white linen shirt. Be quiet and listen carefully. There were gasps around the room. Mr. Waters, you don't want to do this. A deceptively calm Kepler spoke. You and I can go into the hall to discuss this. Or better yet, you can let these people go and have our conversation right here. No. Lincoln shook his head. Everyone needs to be here. If one person leaves this room without my permission, I blow us all to bits. What do you want, Mr. Waters? Questioned Kepler holding his hands up so Lincoln could see he had nothing in them. I'm sure we can come to some sort of resolution. I want you to obey instructions and take a step back, warned Lincoln. Kepler took a small step back. See, I did what you said. You're in control of the situation, Mr. Waters. Tell us how to help you. Everyone needs to calm down, said Lincoln his hands moving in agitation as he spoke. Just be quiet. Ladies, to the back of the room. No one near the exits. Everyone in the room shuffled to do as he had instructed. Do you have any demands? questioned Kepler. I can get the FBI on the phone in a moment and let them know that you're willing to negotiate despite the bomb strapped to you. Shut up, growled Lincoln. He took a deep breath to try to calm down. Someone get Agent Kepler under control before I have to do something about him. Max and Drew both stepped forward, pulling Kepler back toward the group. Kepler turned to face them, whispering, We need to find a way to get him to talk. He's talking just fine, said Drew with a wary eye on Lincoln. Who is he? Lincoln Waters, supplied Henry. He's in direct competition with the hotel industry to the Ramsley Hotel chain. The last time I saw him was during Nate's funeral, and he seemed friendly enough. I have no idea what he's doing here, or what he thinks he is doing. I want everyone to give up their cell phones. Lincoln pulled a bag out of the ill-fitting blazer's pocket. Dylan Ramsley can collect your cell phones. If anyone decides to be a hero and keep their phone... They're not going to make it out of this room. Kepler was about to speak again, but Henry put a restraining hand on his arm. Dylan is at the hospital with Kelly. She's having the baby, explained a calm Henry as he stepped forward from the group. He held out a hand. If you give me the bag, I will collect the phones for you. Lincoln hesitated a moment. His eyes darted around the room before shoving the bag at Henry. Okay. Okay, you can collect them. Henry nodded. Thanks, Lincoln. You thanked him? whispered a confused Noah to Henry as his phone was confiscated. It's a good thing. Build a rapport with him, encouraged Drew. Maybe you can reach him. I'll try, grimly promised Henry as he took Drew's phone, placing it in the bag. He continued to move around the room. Mr. Waters, we are cooperating with you, interrupted Kepler. As a gesture of goodwill, you could let one of the hostages go. There's no need to set that bomb off. Are you trying to get us all killed? hissed Drew as Kepler dropped his phone into the sack. Negotiations 101, started Kepler before he was interrupted. Bree Henson, she can leave, decided Lincoln, his eyes darting around the room. So can any unmarried woman who gives up their phone. I don't want to leave, protested Bree, holding on to Everett's arm. Bree? warned Everett. He whispered something in her ear. Now go. Take Kitty with you, 
Ben took Kitty's hand, pulling her over to Bree. Ben? A wide-eyed Kitty looked back at him, as Bree took her by the arm, dragging her towards the doors. Not you. You must stay. Lincoln pointed to Cora, who abruptly stopped, looking at Lincoln like a deer caught in the headlights. You married a Ramsley. You stay. Come here, Cora. Anne put an arm around Cora, drawing her towards the back of the room. Drew? Bethany had made her way through the crowd, coming to take his hand. Listen to me. Drew brought her closer, whispering in her ear. Go to the front desk. Have them call the police. Have them evacuate the building. I love you. She nodded and took a deep breath before heading for the doors. Mr. Waters, surely there is something we can do to come to a resolution, began Kepler before he was stopped by Lincoln. Agent Kepler, if you interrupt me again, you won't get out of this room alive, warned Lincoln. Do you have all the phones yet? Here are the phones, Lincoln. Henry held out the bag. I collected all of them, just as you asked. Fine. Henry grabbed the bag, tossing it onto the floor beside him. Now what? A cautious Henry asked. Everyone signs the paper, said Lincoln as he pulled a folded sheet of paper out of the other pocket of the blazer. Take that paper and make sure everyone signs it. What is it? asked Jake. It doesn't matter what it is, just sign it, ordered Lincoln. It's okay, coached Henry as he held out his hand. Just give me the paper and I'll get this done for you. Lincoln handed over the paper, and Henry began rotating amongst the group. It looks like the last page on a contract, frowned Noah. Contracts are not legal when signed under duress, noted Jake as he scrawled something illegible across the paper. It will be thrown out of any court. While the group murmured complaints, Drew pulled Kepler closer, taking advantage of the distraction. Any experience with bombs? questioned Drew in a quiet voice. None, muttered the FBI agent. What about you? Two months with the bomb squad, grimly replied Drew. Two months? repeated Kepler, shooting Drew an inquiring look. Long enough to realize I wasn't really grasping the basics, and I didn't want to lose my fingers or worse, revealed Drew. Are we saying our most experienced person in this room with explosives is Max Ramsley? An incredulous Kepler asked. Yep, sighed Drew. I will wait for the experts to arrive, decided Kepler. The hostage negotiator and bomb squad will be on their way. Do you think they're going to get here on time? inserted Max from behind them. As long as we let Waters think he is in control of the situation, we have time, answered an irritated Kepler. No one makes any sudden moves. He isn't in control, a grim Drew observed. He's sweating, trembling, and his voice is shaking. I would be too if I had a bomb strapped to me, noted Max dryly, as he watched Lincoln wipe his forehead on his sleeve. If he isn't in control, then who is? Kepler narrowed his eyes as he studied Lincoln. Is that an earpiece or a hearing aid? An earpiece, decided Drew with a frown. Someone is feeding him what to say. If that's the case, he might just be as much of a hostage as we are, commented Max. How do you negotiate in this situation? We don't, warned Kepler. If our hypothesis is true... The real perpetrator is removed from the situation, and their life isn't on the line. They intend to remain anonymous. In all likelihood, they'll complete their mission. If I could block the wireless signal, can you guys disable the bomb? Softly questioned Ben as he stepped up to join the small group of men. Waters has a detonator in his hand, a wry Kepler pointed out. It's a fake, asserted Ben. There's no wireless signal coming from it and no cord. The entire thing is controlled from a cell phone, which is located under his right arm. How did you know where the cell phone is? wondered Drew. I saw it when he lifted his blazer to show the room the bomb, shrugged Ben. You're absolutely certain there's no signal from the detonator? Max tried to get a better look at Lincoln, but Drew put a restraining hand on his shoulder. Positive, said Ben. There's a signal from the phone, though. How do you know? 
wondered Drew as he glanced at Lincoln, trying to see the hidden phone without looking too suspicious. I have an app that I wrote to look for wireless signals which I can piggyback on for coding if necessary. There is only one wireless signal coming from him. I saw the cell phone. Therefore, the cell phone is the only thing that is sending or receiving signals, observed Ben. It's on a two-second lapse, which means we basically have two seconds to interfere if the real bomber presses the code in his cell phone and hits send. Piggyback for coding? Max raised an eyebrow. Ben winced. Probably better you don't know much about it. Especially when it's in a gray area for legalities, warned Kepler. Hey, ever since the incident, I have behaved, defended Ben. I'm squeaky clean. The last thing I need is the FBI, CIA, NSA, or whatever amalgamation of letters deciding my fate. The incident? Questioned Drew to Max. Max shrugged. No idea. I want to know more, though. Irrelevant to our current situation, decided Kepler. Can you block the wireless signal? For a short period of time, Ben carefully showed them his phone, keeping it out of line of the sight of Lincoln. I can jam all the signals in a small grid area, about a 30-foot radius. The problem is my phone doesn't have enough juice to keep it up for long. Keeping your phone was risky, admonished Max. What if he had seen you and blown us up like he threatened to? It was a calculated risk. Plus, I have two phones on hand, so I only gave up one of them. Then, if Henry is questioned, he doesn't have to lie, admitted Ben. I was hoping to hack Water's phone, but it would take too long. Jamming the signal is the best I can do on short notice. I'm willing to bet Waters doesn't want to be in this situation any more than we do, inserted Drew, eyeing a nervous Lincoln. I think there's another guy behind all this, and Waters is a pawn. If we can intercept the signal, he will likely help us. It's a risk, murmured Kepler. How long can you intercept the signal? A couple of minutes, answered Ben. He paused with a grimace. Maybe. It's going to drain the battery quickly. There's a serious flaw with this plan, noted Kepler. Just one? asked Drew in disbelief. Two minutes isn't enough time to get a member of the bottom squad on the phone and defuse it, especially if there's any booby traps, explained Kepler. All cell phone signals will be jammed, said Ben. We won't be able to phone anyone within a 30 to 50 feet radius of my phone. No internet, no signals at all. What if we let it blow up? mused Max. Excuse me? frowned Drew. I know you're not the smartest guy, but I think that's the opposite of what we're trying to accomplish here. Ben jams the signal. That gives us two minutes to get Waters out of the bomb vest without anyone dying and dispose of it somewhere safe, suggested Max. Like maybe a dumpster outside the hotel? Something that would contain most of the blast, which would minimize the damage. Provided we know where the nearest dumpster is, and depending on the explosive load, sighed Drew. It might work. All of the Ramsley hotels are set up essentially the same way, advised Ben thoughtfully. There's a housekeeping door off the back alley, which we would be able to access. It's going to be a sprint, but we should be able to make it. If Waters cooperates... If we can get him to the dumpster on time, if we get the vest off, and if we can do it before Ben's phone runs out of battery. Grimace, Kepler. There are too many variables. We don't know for certain if he's acting on his own or with guidance. It's all speculation which could get people killed. What other choice do we have? Questioned Max. We can wait for the experienced professionals to show up, rather than trying to die heroes, said a slightly sarcastic Kepler. I put in a call to the FBI, said the word bomb before giving my phone to Henry. The bomb squad will be here soon with a hostage negotiator. We follow protocol and wait. GPS tracking on your phone, remarked Ben. That's how they know to come here. And I'm on assignment here at the hotel, dryly noted Kepler. What if he isn't working on his own? What if he's being told what to do by someone? Asked Max. I've met Lincoln a few times. He doesn't seem like the type to suddenly strap on a bomb and threaten people. Desperate people do desperate things, muttered Drew as he studied Lincoln. If he's acting on his own, I think he will negotiate. If he isn't acting on his own? Questioned Ben. 
Then negotiating won't do any good, muttered Kepler. However, it's not for us to decide. We wait for the professionals. What if the professionals take too long? mused Ben. He stiffened as the door to the room opened and Addison entered. Oh, no. I found my passport. Addison trailed off as she took in the situation, stopping in surprise when she spotted Lincoln Waters wearing a vest of explosives. Link? He stared at her and swallowed hard. His face lost all color. You're not supposed to be here. Addison swayed a little, and Henry came forward, reaching out to steady her. I don't understand. Her voice cracked a little as she looked at Lincoln in confusion. Go stand with Cora at the back of the room, a quiet Henry told her, taking her by the shoulders to tug her toward the others. You will be safer there. This isn't supposed to happen, breathed Lincoln in horror as he stared at Addison. You said she wouldn't be here. You promised she would survive if I did this. He isn't working alone, a grim Drew stated. Or he's suffering a mental episode and is off his meds, muttered an unconvinced Kepler. We should wait. While he argues with the man behind all of this who is deciding whether or not to push the button? An alarmed Max questioned. I can't do this, a shaking Lincoln exclaimed, pulling out the earpiece and letting it fall to the floor. Cut the signal, Ben, growled Drew as he spotted the screen of the cell phone trapped to Lincoln light up. Drew searched forward toward Lincoln. Now! Okay. A slightly panicked Ben pressed buttons on his phone. I got it! Everyone to the back of the room, yelled Kepler to the group of Ramsleys. Someone make sure everyone stays here out of danger while we deal with the situation. You need to keep up! Max grabbed Ben's arm, dragging him along with him as they chased after Drew, who was muscling Lincoln out of the door. Which way are we going? demanded Drew. Left, sputtered Ben as he raced along, chasing Max. At the end of the hall, take a left for the stairs and head down. Get running, Waters, ordered Drew as he pulled the man along. We're going to get that vest off, but you need to help us. How? gasped Lincoln as he ran with them. I'll do anything. Please get it off. Do you remember what happened? questioned Drew. This crazy guy with a gun came into my hotel room and put this bomb on me. He told me to follow the directions or Addison would die, responded Lincoln. Stairs, pointed Ben. They burst through the doors, barreling down the stairs. Can you remember how he hooked up the bomb? asked Drew. Was there a specific wire he put together, a clip? I don't know, responded Lincoln as he stumbled on a step before writing himself. The guy made me close my eyes. I had a black sack over my head while he put it on me. This way. Ben pushed through the exit doors as Max pulled the fire alarm. Just in case, spoke Max as he followed them outside. In case what? A worried Lincoln questioned. In case I blow up? It's a possibility. Drew didn't sugarcoat the situation. Oh, a panicked Lincoln continued to run with the group toward the end of the alleyway. Would someone mind telling my wife this wasn't my idea, that I would be there for our future if I could? It's not over yet, advised Max. Here, gasped Ben as they made it to a trio of dumpsters. He flipped open a lid. This one's unlocked. Let me see the vest. Drew pulled the ill-fitting blazer jacket off Lincoln with the man's help, tossing it to the ground as he began tracing wires with his fingertips. Looks a little more complicated than what I use for blasting, murmured Max as he inspected the vest as well. How much time do we have, Ben? At this rate, 35 seconds, maybe 40? Ben eyed his phone. If we pull the cell phone on his vest, would that stop it from blowing up? It's the phone which is going to send the signal to the wires. It could be set to automatically explode if we remove it, muttered Drew. Look here, there's only two wires running at this point. If we can cut the vest, we might have enough room to slip it over waters without having to cut any wires. You have a knife? questioned Kepler as he caught up to them. Ben looked at his phone. Thirty seconds. I have one. Max pulled out a folding blade out of his pocket. Always useful on the construction site. Or at a hotel for the weekend, noted Kepler. I must have put it in my pocket by habit. Shrugged Max as he carefully cut the fabric of the vest, 
trying not to cut Lincoln or the bomb itself. Wait, cautioned Drew. He slipped a hand between Lincoln's torso and the vest, feeling. With a grimace, he slipped his hand back out. Hidden wires. Now what? asked Max. Give me the knife and back away, advised Drew. What? an alarmed Ben asked. All of you, except for Bomb Guy here, go as far as you can, put your hands over your head, and crouch down facing away from us, ordered Drew. Oh no, breathed Lincoln, closing his eyes and muttering a prayer. He weaved on his feet for a moment. Drew grabbed him by the vest and gave him an abrupt shake. Stay on your feet! A shocked Lincoln nodded and took a deep breath. We should have waited for the bomb squad, grimly said Kepler as he backed away. I'm not letting you do this, a grim Max told Drew. Beth will love me if I have fingers or not. Your wife loves her pretty boy husband, so you should stay handsome and whole. Drew tried to make light of the situation as he took the knife out of Max's hand. Plus, you have two kids. Drew, protested Max to his half-brother. Fifteen seconds, maybe, stated Ben. I can't promise more time. I'm down to three percent battery. Get out of here, warned Drew, as he firmly grasped the knife and clasp which was holding the vest together. Ten. Ben began counting down, laying the phone on the ground and quickly backing away. A helpless Max retreated with Ben. Taking a deep breath, Drew cut. Then he cut again, severing the clasp and a couple more inches of vest. He slashed at the other side, hoping to give Lincoln enough room to wriggle out of the vest. I don't think you have any longer, declared Ben. Phone is going to shut down any second. Help me get it off, Drew ordered Lincoln, who hastily complied. Grabbing the vest, Drew threw it into the dumpster. Turning, he hustled the shaking Lincoln away from the dumpster. Run! Max pulled Ben along by an arm, racing down the alley. They stopped near the doors where they had exited the building earlier. How big of a load do you think the explosives have? asked Drew as he looked back at the now distant dumpster. We should be safe at this distance, estimated Max. I guess the phone had more juice than I thought, a surprised Ben stated. Thank you, breathed Lincoln, before he crouched down, putting his head in his hands. Thank you. Ben and Drew flinched as the dumpster exploded, the plastic lid and trash flying into the air. I love a good explosion, grinned Max, as the trash burned, some lighter pieces falling slowly through the sky. You're crazy, a grim Drew looked at Max. I always suspected, but this confirms it. You love me anyways, warmly declared Max. You have to. We're brothers. Half-brothers, clarified Drew. That still makes us family, a happy Max informed him. All of the Ramsleys are insane, muttered Kepler as he watched the carnage. Thank you for listening to this chapter of The Wedding, book 10 of the Ramsley Brothers series. Did you know I have a newsletter? If you go to my website, josephinebindema.com, you can sign up for my newsletter and get sneak peeks at covers, future scenes, and all sorts of news, plus amazing book promos from other authors in the industry. Go to josephinebindema.com to sign up. Happy listening!